when we chant the standard formula for goodwill, you may have noticed one of the phrases. When you direct goodwill to yourself, it's, may I look after myself with ease. And when you direct goodwill for all beings, may all beings look after themselves with ease. In other words, goodwill is informed by the teachings on karma, realizing that we create our own suffering. After all, it is our own craving that enslaves us and causes suffering, and nobody's going to be able to undo our craving for us. It means, one, we have to want to undo it, and two, we have to learn the skills to do it. This is one of the reasons why the Buddha taught only after being invited to teach and set a standard that you teach the Dharma to people who show respect and basically people who want to hear. The people don't want to hear that they have to work on their problem. Then it's the same in Thai. It's like playing a flute for a water buffalo. The buffalo doesn't appreciate it and you waste your time. The Dharma is for people who see that they are causing their own suffering and want to learn the skills to learn how to stop doing that. As, as the Buddha said, when you act for your own benefit, one, you're trying to overcome your own passion, aversion, and delusion, and two, you observe the precepts. It's interesting. We think of the precepts as ways of protecting others from our unskillful habits, and that is true. But the real protection of the precepts comes to us. When we don't do anything unskillful, then we're not going to have to reap the re results of having done things that are unskillful. And by the same token, when we want to work for the benefit of others, we try to convince them not to break the precepts and to try to overcome their own passion, aversion, and delusion. In other words, we look at others not in terms of being passive recipients of our actions. We see them as agents, too. People are going to reap the rewards of their actions or reap the punishments of their actions. And so to be really kind to them, on the one hand, you want to set a good example. It doesn't carry much weight if you're going around killing and stealing and having illicit sex, and then you try to tell other people not to do those things. You set the example. And this is one of the reasons why we meditate, to learn the skills first, the precepts, and then the skills for dealing with whatever's coming up in our own minds in terms of passion, aversion, and delusion, both through concentration and discernment. So as we're meditating, we're learning how to look after ourselves with ease. We sometimes hear that you develop the precepts or the, vir or the virtues that correspond to the precepts, and then you practice concentration, and then you develop discernment. But these three parts of the path are all interrelated. After all, the Eightfold Path starts with right view and right result, which is discernment, and then moves into virtue, then on to concentration. So you need some discernment to develop your own virtue, and you also need some concentration, the ability to make up your mind to do something and to stick with it. That's an important skill that you develop through concentration. And there's also that sense of well-being that comes when you learn how to stay with the breath. I was talking today to a group of people who've been taught that meditation is all about simply maintaining mindfulness in daily life watching what comes up and goes, goes away in their minds. And they found that the minds run away from them. And it's like not, when they run away, it's not that they run away from them, it runs away with them, i.e. it's like being on a runaway horse. Or to use the Buddha's image, it's like having some animals tied to some leashes, and you're standing in the middle holding the leashes, and they're going to pull you. And whichever animal is strongest, 
It's going to pull you in its direction. The, ample, <clears throat> the examples he gives are a crocodile and a monkey and a bird and a hyena and a dog. Well, of those, the crocodile is going to be the strongest. It's going to drag you down into the river. And if you don't let go, you're going to get drowned. So the way you make sure you don't get dragged around by things is you have mindfulness here immersed in the body. Now, an important step in immersing mindfulness in the body is learning how to breathe in ways that are really comfortable. Because when you have this sense of ease, you have this sense of well-being, it helps you resist the temptation to go running off with whatever animal wants to pull you in whichever way. So as we're meditating here, we're learning how to look after ourselves with ease, and we're learning the skills that go with that. It's not simply that you make up your mind, I'm not going to behave in an unskillful way, and think that that decision on its own is going to, to end the problem. If you have some unskillful habits, you have these well-worn pathways in the mind, and it's very easy to run down them, especially if you're feeling hungry for pleasure, if you're feeling some sort of lack, some sort of dis-ease inside, you go running out with whatever comes in to the mind and then takes you away. But if you've got a sense of well-being right here, feels good to breathe in, feels good to breathe out, you've learned the skill of breathing. Then you have something to resist those other temptations. And you can look after yourself. One, you find it easier to observe the precepts, and two, you find it easier to not give in to passion, aversion, and delusion. You see these things coming because the mind is quieter, and you can resist their pull because you have something else to hold on to. If you're out in the middle of the ocean with nothing to hold on to, then whatever comes by hooks you and will carry you off. But if you're standing in a solid place and you've got something good to hang on to, then it's a lot harder for things to pull you away. So try to get on familiar terms with your breath. Try to learn how to be skillful with your breathing. It's an unusual idea that breathing is a skill. I mean, everybody can breathe. But the question is, do you do it skillfully? There's a skillful way to breathe in, a skillful way to breathe out. There's a skillful way to relate to the breath as you breathe in and breathe out. So it's nourishing for the body, and when it's nourishing for the body, it feels good inside. When it feels good inside, down through the most sensitive parts of your body, the mind will respond. It'll want to stay there, because there are parts of your body that are starved of breath energy. And when you give them some good breath energy, it goes deep down into the mind, that sense of pleasure, that sense of well-being. And it's a sense of pleasure and well-being that's totally harmless. I mean, the harm that comes from pleasure, or sensual pleasure in particular, is one, that it clouds the mind, and two, it makes you do unskillful things in order to maintain it. But this doesn't require that you do anything unskillful, and it actually helps clear the mind. So it's nothing to be afraid of. It's what the Buddha calls not a sensual pleasure, it's a pleasure of form and how you sense the body from within. How do you feel your hands from within? How do you feel your feet from within, your legs, your arms, your torso, your head? Just try to be in touch with that. Try to get on familiar terms with it. When you're on familiar terms, then you can be warm when you want to feel warm, and you can be cool when you want to feel cool. When the body's feeling heavy, you can focus on the breath energy, and things will lighten up. When, the, when you're feeling dizzy, you focus on the earth, the sense of solidity inside. There are ways of balancing things out inside. If your mind is beginning to drift off, try to fill the body with your awareness. In this way, you've got your post that you can tie all the leashes of those animals to. And so even though they may pull at it some, the stronger the post, then the less likely they are to pull you away.
And this is the foundation of the skills that are needed for looking after yourself with ease. And as you do this, you become a good example to others. They can see that it really is possible to work on yourself. And make some important changes, make some radical changes inside. I mean, there's some teachings that you're stuck with a particular self and your particular self is defiled. And no, you can't help yourself. You've got to have somebody else come and help you. But the Buddha doesn't teach like that. He says you've got lots of selves inside. All the different selves you've been using, or senses of self that you've been using over the years to find pleasure in one way or another. And some of them haven't gotten much use, and others are the ones that you use pretty often. And as you begin to sit down and sort through them, you begin to realize, okay, there are some in there that are worth keeping, and there are others that you should put outside the wall. And having the breath as a good place to stay puts you in a position where you can sort through these things so that some of the selves that you used to really feel affection for, even though they didn't lead to much real genuine pleasure, much genuine well-being, you begin to see that that affection is dangerous. It's a delusion. And you can let go of that particular self. And you strengthen the ones that are skillful. So you have selves that are able to look after you with ease. And as the training improves you, their skills get more subtle. And finally, ultimately, you find a happiness that doesn't require anything. It's totally independent. Again, that's something you can find only through your own efforts, which is why the Buddha taught. Not that he was going to save everybody. He taught people how to save themselves from their own passion, aversion, and delusion, from their own tendencies to act in unskillful ways. And this is the greatest kindness of all. There was this strange piece I read recently where saying that the idea that you can save yourself is bad for the environment. They wanted you to stick around and try to make this into a perfect world rather than running away. And I guess their idea was that people who leave this process of samsara feel that since they're going to leave it, they might as well trash it. But that's not how you develop good qualities. That's not how you look after yourself with ease. You treat the world well. And in so doing, you protect yourself. So there's no greater compassion than this. Learn how to show it to yourself. Learn how to show it to others by behaving as a good example. And when they're interested, you can encourage them to practice as well. That's how that wish, may I look after myself with ease, actually becomes a reality. As for others who will look after themselves with ease, that's up to them to decide. Whether they're going to follow the teaching or not. But because everyone has the freedom to choose, this is the best you can do. Any promises that go beyond that are empty.